Good morning. Am I on? You can hear me? There we go. All right. Uh, again, good morning. Maybe I'm a little too hot now. Too high. Um, that's right. She'll get it all adjusted perfectly. So it is great to see you all this morning, um, mid-December, December 17th. And so it is great to be with you. Uh, great to uh, see some new faces this morning. Uh, those of you joining us on Facebook Live, it is great to be with you as well. Great to have you joining us also. So uh, we have a few things to go over with announcements before we get into our worship singing. And so uh, let's begin with that. And I'm going to ask Kathy Scully. Uh, she has an announcement to get us started. Tuesday morning. So if you're available Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. to help wrap, bring a pair of scissors and some tape, and uh, we would love to have you help. Here. Here. Uh, yes, we will meet in the social hall. Everything is back there. And more hands make it go a lot faster. So I think that we... We're currently uh, doing a study entitled Unshakable Hope uh, with the video portion led by Max Lucado. Um, there is prayer meeting this Wednesday, December 20th at 1.30 in my office. So if you're available, please join me for prayer at that time. Um, and men, our men's Bible study is going to take a break for the holidays. So we will be uh, on break and resume meeting on Friday, January 12th. So if you're wondering about that, men, uh, we're taking that break. And then a reminder that next Sunday... December 24th, we will have Sunday school and we will have our regular 11 o'clock service. We will also have our Christmas Eve service that afternoon or evening at 4 p.m. And so uh, the Christmas Eve service uh, will be just a wonderful time of singing, uh, just a short uh, devotional sermon, not a full-length sermon, um, but join us for that. Um, and like Christy said a couple weeks ago, there will be candles. So <laughs> we all look forward to that. Uh, so um, it, again, is just a joy to be together, to worship together. And so if you would stand now, we will join in our worship singing. Good morning, everyone. I don't know where we're at in there. It's in the bulletin, but we're on page 117, and we're going to sing verse 1 and 4. old school this morning. You kind of read it right out of the book. Okay. <laughs> from 
to, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Something interesting about this particular song was it was what, it, the, originally it was a poem in 1816. In 1818 in Salzburg, Austria, there was a cathedral there next to the river, and there was concern on Christmas Eve that the organ had been damaged by water. So they actually penned this uh, melody and put it to the poem in 1818 and sang it for the first time. And they made it because they weren't sure the organ was going to play. They wrote it to play it on the guitar. So here we go. This won't quite be probably as nice as it was in the giant cathedral in uh, Salzburg in 1818. But Silent night. Silent night. Good morning. It's nice to see some new faces and some new faces and some people we see. Hi, Silas. Um, if you would say hello to the person to your right or left or behind you. <laughs> hello to you online. We're happy you joined us. Um, so this scripture morning, this morning is Luke 1, 39 through 45. At the time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Okay, 
Hey kids, who's brave? Who wants to open my present? Mina, come on up. Silas, I'll give you a different job. You can stay up here if you want. I'll give you a different job. Do you want to take your, do you want to take your hat off? Okay, cool. You want to open my present? I don't think there's anything in there. There's something in there. There, you know, I think it's wise of you to question. Is there treats? I don't think there's anything. Oh, there's something in there. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Um, it's just a piece of paper. It is a piece of paper. It's baby Jesus. No, it's a strong guy. Wait, right? It's a book guy. Wait, what? Do you want to show them what That's it is? Baby Maybe Jesus. they'll tell you. I think, what is I think that? Mom would know what that is. That's a baby in um, the, his mother's womb. Right, it is a baby in its mother's womb, right? I should know right? that because my mom is a doctor. And right, she is. She yeah, that. a sonogram, right? Mm -hmm. And so baby John the Baptist was inside of his mom's womb, right? And when it heard Alyssa, uh, Mary's voice, oop, it jumped up inside, up and down inside because they were excited. What, what were they filled with? Do you know what they were filled with? Baby, though? No, babies jump hair. around a lot in there. Yeah, yes, the mommies. Yeah, it's a lot. So when the baby's jumping around and they're excited, what word did Elizabeth use? Do you know? Do you remember from the Bible, from the scripture? Well, this morning is joy, right? So it uses the word joy. You sure can, but hang on a second. So how did you feel, Mina, when you got picked to open this present? You felt pretty good, right? Because opening presents is really fun, right? And we all get to open, or prayerfully, we'll all get a chance to open some presents on Christmas morning, right? And we have this experience of expectancy and excitement, and we open our gifts and we're filled with joy. And the Bible's full of a lot of amazing babies. Like, we can just go through from the beginning to the end, and there's all, these excite, all this excitement about babies, right? And so we are expect, filled with joy as we wait through Advent for Christmas morning, where we can remember the gift of Jesus, right? That he's come for us, and we can give each other gifts so we can remember that. And then in the um, passed out this morning, because I forgot to put in the bulletin, there's a liturgy for wrapping presents. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have never prayed before in my life while wrapping a present. But some people at the rabbit room, which is this creative space um, for the Lord, uh, came up with this prayer that you could pray while you're wrapping presents, which I think is a pretty cool thing to do um, during this time. So let's light some candles, okay? You guys want to both help? There's three well, candles. It okay, might be pretty dangerous because... Mm, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I love it. I have wheels okay. on my shoes. So you, how about you light, the, you light the first one, okay? So the first one is the one of hope. She pushed the button Wait, down. <laughs> Excellent. Sound effects are always good. Okay, there we go. That way people watching have something to listen to. There you go. Almost. Keep going. Keep, it's just trying. People are filled with expectation while they wait for us to do this. <laughs> How hard can I help you with Why this? Why do they have to make these things out of plastic? I'll keep it lit. You light it, okay? I think they're hoping that um, children will be safe around them. That's why they make it difficult. Okay, good. And then let's let it I'll hold it on. And then, and then what's this candle for? So we had hope, and then we have, you remember from last week? Joy? Almost. It's not joy. It's, it's, it's peace. what your peace. Can it's what you're really excited about when you go to bed. Right? And then this one... <laughs> Is what? What's I don't know one? which one's which. It's joy. It's joy. I so don't we know have which hope, one's which. peace, and joy. Um, because of how far they burnt down. Because this one is burnt down the farthest. Okay. Thanks, friends. Good job. You can keep your sonogram if you want to. Yay. Yay. Okay. Sonogram. Let's pray. Yay. <laughs> Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for help. It's pretty great and that we're not alone and that we can help one another to do things and to grow and to change. We thank you for this Advent. This Sunday of Advent that represents the joy and the joy that we that can be found in you and the joy that we can have of expectancy of waiting for Christmas Day and for the gift of your son that came all the way down. It's kind of crazy to think about the creator of the universe being made into a, a little tiny baby that was waiting inside to be born, waiting in a womb. Um, it's just such an amazing, miraculous thing to think about. So we praise you and thank you. Help fill us with your, your spirit and a sense of wonder and expectation this Christmas season. Amen. The other thing that I just 
love and brings me joy is the way God works. Um, so Christiana didn't know what scripture I my sermon was on today, and I didn't know what scripture her children's sermon was on today um, until until now, and we. God led us to the same scripture. So I will be preaching on the same passage as well. And I think that's did just you bring a sonogram? incredible. I did not bring a sonogram. So, uh, But I do have a verbal description of the jumping for joy right. in the womb. So there we go. <laughs> well, at this point in time, we have our opportunity to go before God as a congregation in prayer. And again, for those of us who know uh, Christ as our Lord and Savior, We've been adopted into the family of God. And he invites us, not just encourages us, but invites us to come directly to him. And so that's what we have the chance to do right now is come directly to him with our prayers. Our prayers of thanks, our, our prayers of joy, and also our prayers of request. And so during this time... I want to invite you, if you feel comfortable praying out loud, I want to invite you to pray a prayer out loud during this time. And if you're not comfortable praying out loud, uh, no problem. I want to just encourage you to pray silently with us. And if you're here this morning and you feel like, I don't know how to pray or I'm not sure what to pray, again, no problem because Scripture says the Spirit will pray on your behalf. So let's go before God together in prayer. And Lord, we do come before you. And we do praise you and we do thank you for the joy that you give. We thank you for the joy of this time of Advent, the, the joy of remembering the, the anticipation, the expectation of the Savior to be born. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the joy that you put into our lives uh, day in and day out. Lord, that reminder that that joy is not the same thing as happiness. Happiness is an emotion and joy is more of a choice um, so that we can follow your word and have joy or rejoice even during trials and hard times. Um, and so, Lord, uh, we again remember the joy of this season. Lord, the joy of being able to be called your children the joy of being able to come directly to you as our Father with our prayers. Lord, the joy of being together, of worshiping you through song, uh, through fellowship, through prayer, and through your word and what you have to say to us. Lord, we have so much to be joyful for. And so, Lord, we take this time now to pray together as a congregation. So hear us as we pray now. continue to show his faces even when I'm not looking for you to show up, but when you do, I'm just so overwhelmed by that, Father. I'm so thankful that you are here. 
Lord, I just praise you again for the way that you orchestrate things. From the way you um, orchestrate just our gathering every week to the leading of worship songs. Lord, to the children's message and the sermon and the sound and PowerPoint and Sunday school and the greeters and the offering and the list goes on and on and on. Thank you for this family, this body of believers that love you, that serve you by serving one another. Lord, what, what an incredible bless, blessing it is. And Lord, we do pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear from you what it is you want to say to each one of us this morning. And Lord, again, we pray that all that we do, both individually as well as as a congregation, Lord, that you would be glorified. And so, Lord, we lift these things to you now, and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed to Children's Church. And as they head out, we will have our scripture reading and the Lord's Prayer, which won't be on the overhead. <laughs> the scripture reading this morning is from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And the world became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. <coughs> and our prayer this morning, Lord's Prayer, join with me please. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And if you will stand, we will continue our worship singing. On page 120, the first Noel, singing verses 1, 2, and 3.
Well, if you want to turn and put your finger there, the scripture for today is Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 65. And we're continuing with this Christmas series uh, that I've titled Christmas Cousins. And today's sermon title is Jumping for Joy. Well, George was 92 and his bride-to-be was 89 years old. They were so excited about getting married in just a few weeks. They strolled hand in hand over to the pharmacy on the corner and asked to speak to the manager. We are about to get married, George informed him. Uh, do you have any heart medication? Uh, of course we do, replied the manager. Oh, oh good. Uh, do you stock support hose to help with poor circulation? Definitely, said the manager. What about medication for rheumatism, osteoporosis, and arthritis, George asked, looking down at his list. Yes, we've got all that, the manager said. Well, what about hearing aids, denture supplies, and reading glasses? Yep, we've got all that readily available. Ooh, what about eye drops, sleeping pills, Geritol, and Insure in several different flavors? <coughs> Giggling, said, yep, got all that on the shelves ready to go. And George asked, do you sell walkers, wheelchairs, and canes too? The manager replied, we've got all kinds and all sizes. But if you don't mind me asking, why all the questions? George smiled and said, because we'd like to use your store for our bridal registry. <laughs> Now, I'm sure you might be wondering, what in the world does that have to do with anything in Scripture? Well, we've been introduced to a couple in their old age, in their 80s, who instead of shopping for things that we might expect, stuff that they might want for their years of retirement on the farm, they were instead planning a baby shower. They had their list. They had a pretty, a pretty good idea of what life held in store for them. They thought it would be brands like Geritol, not Gerber. They thought it would be rocking chairs, not a rocking horse. And they certainly did not think that the rocking would be of their own child to sleep. But all of that had changed. Now, their biggest challenge was trying to figure out where to put the baby's room, as well as answer a million questions like, how in the world would they ever keep up with a two-year-old? The angel Gabriel had appeared, and his message blew their minds. By the supernatural power of God in their old age, they were about to become parents for the first time and they were going to have a baby boy. And not just any boy, 
they were about to become the parents of the first prophet to speak to in Israel for 400 years. Well, last week, we looked at the scripture where Zechariah did not believe the angel. He, he asked the angel for a sign to prove what the angel said was true. And again, personally, I think this is absolutely astounding. An angel from God appears with a message, and Zechariah wants a sign from God. Like I said last week, and again, I just read that, and I'm like, what more of a sign could you want? But Gabriel agreed to Zechariah's request, and the sign the angel gave him was the paralysis of his vocal cords. Zechariah would be unable to hear or speak until his son was born. And with that, Gabriel leaves. Gabriel will not show up again until he makes an appearance to Elizabeth's cousin, a young girl named Mary, who is neck deep in wedding preparations. She was probably putting the finishing touches on her wedding dress. She plans to be married in the next few months and is most likely dreaming of the festival and feasting and what it will be like to be married to her beloved. However, all of her plans will be changed as well. The festival and the wedding feast and all the extended family plans will be abruptly halted. Her list of to-dos will be changed forever. It's her turn to be visited by Gabriel. Both she and Joseph are about to have their world turned upside down. Well, Luke gives us the details in the first chapter of his gospel. Luke leaves Zechariah and Elizabeth for a moment as he shifts the spotlight onto Mary. So let's jump right into the announcement of Gabriel to Mary, found in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. You could say that Gabriel backs the prophetic truck up and just unloads it. He makes at least eight predictions, or prophecies you might say. One, Mary, you will be with child. You will conceive in your womb. Two, you will give birth to a son. No having to worry or wonder or wait to find out what the gender of the child is. You will give birth to a son. Third, you will give him the name Jesus. Fourth, he will be great. Fifth, he will be the son of the Most High. These five prophecies were fulfilled at Christ's first coming. The next three prophecies in Gabriel's truckload will come to pass at Christ's second coming. So, number six, the Lord God will give to God the Son the throne of his earthly forefather David. Seven, he will reign over the house of Jacob, or Israel, forever. And eight, in fact, he will reign over everything and everyone forever and without end. Eight rapid fire, centuries sweeping, kingdom coming prophecies that begin with Mary's pregnancy and end with the eternal state of heaven. I think it's interesting that Mary gets stuck on the first prediction, the first prophecy. You will conceive in your womb. In fact, her first response was similar, but not exactly the same, but similar to Zechariah's. Notice verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, remember Zechariah's response back in verse 18, where it said, And Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man. And my wife, well, I won't say she's an old woman, but she's advanced in years. You need to give me a sign. How are you going to pull this off? 
Now Mary here responds with the words, How? I am a virgin. I find it interesting that it seems like God held Zechariah to greater accountability. He is a veteran priest. He's knowledgeable in the scripture and in the history of Israel. God had taken an old couple and had given them, Abraham and Sarah, a baby boy. If he did it before, he certainly could do it again. I need a sign for my unbelief is effectively what Zechariah is saying. So Zechariah is disciplined while Mary isn't. Mary didn't understand the process. For Zechariah, it was more a problem of theology, while for Mary, it was a problem of biology. That doesn't make sense in the natural world. So Gabriel, in the kindness of God, provides insight. Notice verse 35. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That word, overshadow, is the same word used by Matthew, Mark, and Luke to describe the cloud of God's presence that settled over the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was briefly revealed in brilliant light and the glory of God. It's also the same idea of the Old Testament description of the cloud that covered the tabernacle when the tent was filled with the glory of God, found in Exodus chapter 40. And that might explain it, but we still don't understand it. Gabriel kindly encourages Mary to hang on to this thought. Notice verse 37. For nothing is impossible with God. For nothing is impossible with God. And Gabriel is not just quoting scripture. He is also speaking as an eyewitness. He stood in the presence of God. He knew. He had seen countless miracles throughout the previous centuries. He watched at the dawn of human history as God created with spectacular colors more than a hundred billion galaxies. He watched God craft a man out of dust and a woman out of bone. He was there when God created the animal kingdom both seen and still yet to be discovered by human observation. Gabriel saw the manna fall and the waters part. He has seen time stand still. He watched lions' mouths muzzled and fiery furnaces air-conditioned. Mary, nothing is impossible with God, and Gabriel should know. He watched God take the life of every firstborn Egyptian and then spark life in the womb of a barren woman. He saw God flow iron to the surface of water and bring repentance to the hearts of an entire nation. He watched God send a chariot of fire from heaven to bring his prophet home. He saw God tear open the earth and send his enemies to the fires of torment below. He has seen God in all of his terror and in all of his glory. So Gabriel essentially says, Mary, let me tell you what I know and what I've seen. Nothing is impossible with God. God can overshadow your womb, bring life to one of your eggs by his divine touch, and turn your womb into a holy of holies. So that offspring will be fully God and fully man. Fully God capable of living a perfect life in order to become the sinless sacrifice. Fully human, fully flesh and blood, capable of being touched with the feelings of our infirmities, capable of suffering, and capable of dying. Mary effectively responds by saying in verse 38, Here I am. I present my body to God as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to him, which is the most reasonable thing that I could ever do for him. What Gabriel says next is so gracious as the word of God descends to match the heart of this young lady, no older than 14 or 15 years of age. Look at verse 36. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. Now, Gabriel just happens to drop the name of Mary's cousin into the mix. But there's so much more to it that I know in my past, I've just kind of read that. I was like, oh, cool, and just kept reading on. But think about this. Here's what's happening. Essentially, Gabriel is saying, Mary, you need somewhere to go. Your reputation is about to be destroyed. You're unmarried and about to become pregnant. In fact, as soon as Joseph hears about this, he will assume what everyone else will assume. And I'm going to need to visit Joseph in the night to keep him from breaking off your engagement. As we've studied the incarnation in light of these two cousins, Mary and Elizabeth, it's important to understand that for Elizabeth, the news of her pregnancy will actually end her shame. It will sweep away the dust of suspicion that has dogged her heels for 50 years. Her inability to become pregnant, as we looked at in the past two weeks in this series, was tantamount under the Abrahamic covenant of God's displeasure. So her pregnancy will end her shame and restore her reputation. But for Elizabeth's cousin Mary, her pregnancy will begin a life full of clouds of suspicion that will gather and never leave her alone. Elizabeth's world is about to be put together. Mary's world is about to feel like it's falling apart. Mary's world is about to become confusing, filled with accusation and suspicion and gossip. And these events will be the talk of the town. And we can imagine some of the conversations happening in town. Mary is expecting out of wedlock and do we really know who the father is? Uh, even Joseph won't say he's the father. What's up with that? So who is the baby's father? Some have said that Mary claims that the father is actually God. <laughs> this would be considered a very delicious scandal, and everyone wants a taste of it. This would be on the cover of every tabloid at every checkout stand in the grocery store. And we can imagine the headlines will read, Mary expects child, Joseph, not the father. Or Mary's wedding plans postponed. Or Mary expecting and missing. Mary knows that her family will be outraged. Her father will be shamed. The rabbis will be incensed. And she may also be in physical danger. The grace of God to Mary abounds. Gabriel is not just name dropping the favorite cousin of Mary's. This is more than, well, you know, your cousin Elizabeth is expecting a baby too, and she's past childbearing age. Isn't that amazing, Mary? It's more than that. Gabriel is giving Mary information that ultimately provides hope, security, safety, and understanding as well as clarity. Gabriel is essentially saying, Mary, you need someone who understands what it means to live under a cloud of suspicion. You need to learn from someone who learned to keep serving God in spite of tongues wagging and fingers pointing and accusations of shame. Gabriel is giving Mary the name of the only person on the planet who will be able to truly understand. In fact, Mary will be able to help Elizabeth along that line too. Notice verses 39 and 40. 
At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now, to put this in context, too, this was a hundred mile journey, taking Mary three to four days to complete. And there is no mention of a guide or a chaperone or a family member. From what we gather, apparently, Mary is alone. And suddenly, here she is in the doorway, unannounced, unexpected, saying, Hello, Elizabeth. <laughs> and at the sound of her voice, notice, notice verses 41 through 43. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, these are officially Old Testament times. And you might be thinking, well, no, but this is found in the New Testament. Yes, but the Old Testament times ended, you know, ultimately upon Christ's death and resurrection. So these were Old Testament times. The Holy Spirit anointed people. He didn't indwell them if you look through the Old Testament scriptures. That will take place after Pentecost and the creation of the New Testament church. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit came and stayed. In the Old Testament, he would come and go as he did with King Saul. So it's in that context that the Holy Spirit anoints Elizabeth with his inspiring presence. And Elizabeth delivers this amazing declaration. Zechariah, by the way, representing an unbelieving nation, unable to hear from or speak for God, stands there watching. And no doubt, he is rejoicing too, because for them both, the missing piece of the puzzle has just been found. They had been given the message from Gabriel that their son would be the forerunner of the Messiah. But where was the Messiah? If their son was going to introduce to the nation and to the world the Son of God, where is the Son of God? When does he show up? How does he manifest himself? Where, where does he come from? Well, all of those questions are now answered. Elizabeth knew nothing of Mary's visit from Gabriel. She knew nothing of Mary's pregnancy. But at this moment, there in the doorway of her cottage, the truth came to her in a moment. And she exclaimed, Mary, I know who you're carrying. I am in the presence of my Lord. Two cousins are bearing in their bodies the final instruments of redemption. The forerunner of the Messiah who will effectively become the last Old Testament prophet, John. And within Mary, the Messiah, the living Lord, the Son of God. And if that isn't enough of a moment to remember, notice what the preborn baby John does. Elizabeth summarizes it in verse 44. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And as Christiana had said in her children's sermon, you know, a mother knows the sensation of when her baby delivers a kick or turns over. Only a mother knows the sensation of that little baby moving around, getting agitated maybe, not wanting to settle down. And John, by means of the Spirit of God, knows that he is in the presence of Christ, whom he will later introduce. And at six months in the womb, John literally jumps for joy. This was effectively, you might say, John's first prophecy before he's even been born. Now, we're not given the details, but we can imagine that following three, the following three months of fellowship in the home of Zechariah, what wonderful times Mary and Elizabeth would have shared while Mary was a guest in her cousin's home. 
they were kindred cousins, both were miraculously expecting. Both of their sons had been announced by the angel Gabriel. Both were carrying sons who would fulfill prophecies of old. And both sons would have ministries that converged and weaved together. No doubt these women speculated together over scriptures related to their sons' lives and ministries. No doubt they prayed together. They talked about birth and babies. And verse 56 informs us that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Now, Bible scholars have pointed out that that verse, verse 56, is a summary verse given to inform us that Mary leaves after three months, but not necessarily before verse 57 takes place, which is highly significant. The context of John's birth indicates that Elizabeth and Zechariah kept the secret safe until after his birth. In other words, family and friends found out only after she delivered her baby, which means that Mary may very well have played the role of midwife and nursemaid with Zechariah as an assistant. This would have been an important part of Mary's education in childbirth and delivery. Three months after Mary leaves her cousin's house, she will have to deliver her baby with no help from anyone but Joseph. So even in this period of time, God was preparing Mary with what she needed. And what a scene this was at John's birth. The news is out. Elizabeth and Zechariah and everyone there are filled with joy. The text indicates that they had kept the pregnancy a secret all the way through the delivery of John. Only after the baby boy was born were all the neighbors and family invited to share in their joy. And what happens next becomes a defining moment of faith in the hearts of both these new parents. Notice verses 59 through 61. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. I love this scene. It's time to name the boy. But Zechariah still cannot speak a word. So the family decides for him. We'll call him Zachariah Jr. We'll have Big Zach and Little Zach. But Elizabeth speaks up and says in verse 16, No, he is to be called John. And everyone responds, Nobody's named John in your family. That name doesn't even appear anywhere on your family tree. Why would you do such a thing? It was the custom in those days to name a son after a father or a grandfather, especially if their forefathers were noteworthy. Where did John come from? It doesn't sound anything like Zechariah. In fact, it does not even start with the letter Z. I can imagine they were thinking, this must be postnatal confusion. We better ask Dad. And so they do. Look at verses 62 and 63. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. John is not there to carry on the family name. He is there to introduce someone else who will give everyone who believes in him a new name. John is going to introduce an entirely new family. His name, John, means the grace of God, which, by the way, is how anyone gets into the family of God, by his grace. After Zechariah acts in obedience to the message from God, suddenly his tongue is loosed. Look at verses 64 and 65. 
Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. I bet they were. A surprise pregnancy, a priest unable to speak or hear, a lengthy visit by an unmarried pregnant cousin, talk of prenatal prophecies and angelic visitations, plans turned upside down and lives forever changed. This is the talk of that region. In fact, we are still talking about it today. And it made me think, I, I can't help but wonder how prepared we are to have our world changed. Our plans turned upside down. We tend to have our grocery list of things to prepare for that wedding or for retirement, for that first child, that adoption, that job, that career, that education, that house that dream, that plan. And then God interrupts it all with something else. Something different. Maybe something difficult. Something sudden. Something disturbing. Something unexplainable. And you know in your heart that you must obey. You know that there's no excuse to say anything else to God except here I am, Lord. I'll set aside my personal list of items that I'm expecting in life, and I will offer my body, my mind, and my heart to you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is the only reasonable thing for me to do. Easy? No. But in God's economy, Oh, there is so much we can't imagine or dream of or even figure out how, God. But God continues to bless and give grace to all of us. And so we can look at the past and see how God had worked, how God worked in Elizabeth's life, God worked in Mary's life, how God prepared them for what they would go through. And when we look at our list and God changes things and we might find ourselves thinking, how God? We can remind ourselves of his faithfulness in the past and that he will be faithful going forward and he will be faithful to us. Amen. If you would go ahead and stand, we will have our closing song, and then our benediction. Our closing song will be on page 130, O Come All Ye Faithful, and we'll be singing uh, all three verses.
now receive today's benediction, which comes from Psalm 28, verses 7 and 8. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation. Amen.